today we give you a warm welcome. It's good to see you here with us today. I don't have a lot of announcements. I think last week it was announced for the back to school giving table for stationary provision and stuff. So if you could think of, you know, maybe buying some pencils, pens, coloring stuff, pencil cases, and bring them in, that would be greatly appreciated for the back to school giving table. One other announcement. It's a bit early, I know, but knowing what I'm like, if I don't announce it now, I might not announce it as I should do, but we'll hopefully do it in August too. But for those of you who are familiar, or for those of you who are not familiar with the worldwide, the Bangor Worldwide Missionary Convention, it's held in Hamilton Road Presbyterian Church and runs from the 19th to the 28th of August. There's always a fantastic array of speakers connected with different missionary organizations from different parts of the world who, who come along to this and speak at this. There are some leaflets in the welcome area, so please feel free to take one of those. It gives you a little bit of info on who is speaking, a little bit of bio in relation to them, and it gives you an opportunity to see what you might like to go along to. I think we're hoping to get one of the speakers in regard to the leprosy mission maybe for the, the last Sunday in August speaking here. Uh, so please take one of those. And if you haven't ever gone along, could I encourage you to go along? You really will be blessed in terms of all that is done through this uh, wonderful event. It's called Compel this year. We know, of course, that Paul says, the love of Christ compels me to go with the gospel. And of course, that's the greatest reason that we go because of the love of Christ. So take one of those. If you can, that would be great. We're here to worship God, and I want to read just a few verses from Psalm 29 where we hear these words. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. We come together to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, Lord of heaven, who sent forth your Spirit to brood on the surface of the waters, who poured out your Holy Spirit upon those gathered in that upper room many years ago, your Spirit who came flashing forth in flames of fire that the church might come alive in spirit and truth. Let us gathered here today on this Pentecost Sunday in the name of Jesus Christ know your presence and power with us by that same Spirit so that we might be a people who worship you with hearts ablaze, alive in holiness, bold in the radiant purity and righteousness that is credit to us through faith in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. May holy harmony cross between this seen realm and that unseen realm with anthems of adoration, whereby the mighty of heaven and the meek on earth unite with one voice declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Keep us alert, O God, in these moments to the majesty and mercy of the one we are here to worship. And to you be all the glory, eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first piece this morning is His Mercy is More. Let's stand and, and praise Him. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than God. 
we come again to God in prayer and prayers of confession, let us pray. Gracious Father, we confess before you in these moments that often our lives can fluctuate between living by a spirit of legalism or liberalism, when either we lose sight of grace through self-effort and performance, or we take grace for granted with a careless self-indulgence. Lord, have mercy, we pray. Forgive us, Lord God, when all too often we crave more the opinions of others upon our lives to the neglect of prizing your opinion above all else. We curry the favor of those who say we should not behave in one way or of others who say we should behave in another way, and we get torn and troubled in our hearts and minds, often living a life that does not reflect or radiate true grace for your glory. How slow we are to forget where life and freedom is found, for your word reminds us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom, O Lord, that comes to us because the truth of your Son sets us free from bondage to sin and death. May your good Spirit remind and affirm us in these moments, in the glorious truth that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so, Lord God, may we be mindful through that completed, finished work of Jesus Christ, that as we hope in Him as our only salvation, that we know that we are clean in Your sight because of the righteousness of Jesus. Help us, O God, to worship You afresh in the glory of this truth, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, there's no birthday bucket uh, today. There, there is a birthday, but what we're going to do, because there's a number of times when we have birthdays and the folks aren't here for them and so forth, we're actually going to push it to once a month. So we're going to aim for the end of the month where we'll do a, a gathering of all the birthdays. So any birthday requests that are going to happen, get them in and we will do a birthday bucket at the end of the month. David. So we're just going to take a couple of minutes to look at the next question and then there's a little video just to expa uh, expand it a little bit further for us rather than listening to me every week do it. So we're, there's going to be a video on, on this one. So uh, if, if we bring up the question there, thanks Rory, that's great. So we're on to the sixth commandment. We're into that section of the commandments that deals with our relationships with each other. And so this is the sixth commandment. What is the sixth commandment is the question. And the answer is, here it is, the sixth commandment is you shall not murder, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. So we'll just say that through two or three times together as a congregation, and then we'll play the video just as a little bit more of an explanation, because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that's an easy one. You shall not murder. That's easy. I mean, how many of us really are, are, are going to murder someone, take someone's life? So that's easy. There's no, no problem with that one. But then Jesus came along and said something different. Now, I'll say no more about that because the wee video does that better than I could. But let's say it through two or three times together. So I'll ask the question and then we'll say the answer together. What is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is you shall not murder Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. Okay, we'll do it again. What is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is you shall not murder. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. We'll say it one more time and then we'll take the answer away and see if we can say it without it. So one more time with the answer on. What is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is you shall not murder. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. Right, Rory, if you want to take the answer away, right, let's try and say it together. So, what is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is, you shall not murder. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. 
Okay, so we'll play our video before we head out to, uh, before the Poison Guards head out to Transformers. We continue to worship God with our offerings. Your offerings will now be received. While we're going to take a moment to thank God for these offerings, we want to take a moment in our prayers of giving these offerings to God, thankfulness, to take a moment during this Platinum Jubilee to thank God for the, the rule and the reign of Queen Elizabeth. It's quite, been quite a remarkable reign. I don't think any of us are ever going to see the like of it again in, in our lifetime. Maybe <laughs> the really, really young might see something again of it in, in their lifetime. But um, she has been a faithful witness to Jesus Christ, and we're thankful to God for that. So we want to take just a moment or two to pray. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you're the God we come to this day to acknowledge all your goodness to us and all the provision that you give us from your good and gracious hand. Lord God, we thank you that we can take from what we have received and give it for your glory in the gospel as it goes forth in word and deed. And so, Lord God, we are thankful to you for all that you give us. And Lord, we, we know that we never give to try and appease you, to try and attain anything from you. We just simply give because we're grateful, we're thankful for all that you give us. So receive these gifts, we pray. And we ask, O oh God, that the those who have been given the duties to discharge here in this place in terms of how to be good stewards of all that is given, we pray that we would do that in a way that honors you and is helpful to people and that your glory might be seen in that. Lord, we know that giving comes in different ways and we acknowledge today before you, Lord, the faithful service of Queen Elizabeth in this her platinum jubilee year. What grace, O oh God, you have granted her to fulfill those coronation vows she took 70 years ago as one so young, thrust into such prominence following the death of her earthly father. We thank you, Father, that she acknowledges you as sovereign Lord, God above all nations, rulers, and leaders, and that you are the one who has given her strength so that for these decades she has depended on you as her heavenly Father, so that she might be a model monarch whose life, while not free from heartache and disappointment, has shown your strength in her times of weakness. O Lord, only you know the years allotted for, for her and us, but until that time of her departure from this realm, continually strengthen her faith deepen her life of prayer and her sacrificial service, bless her example of godliness, magnify her experience of your love, that she may continue to be a beacon of stability and hope. Shelter her with your everlasting love in this jubilee year that at the last you will say of her, well done, good and faithful servant. But Lord, not only for her, but for us also. May we be those two who are sacrificial in our service, who are rich in faith and deep in prayer and embracing in our love, a love, O oh God, which doesn't affirm all that is wrong because that is not what love is, but love, O oh God, that seeks that people would find true life in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as subjects of the King of all kings, to be the servants you call us to be, so that we too might one day hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And so as we come now to your word, O oh God, we pray that you would speak deeply into our hearts and into our lives. And would you, Lord, just make those truths penetrate to where only your spirit can go, dividing between in our own being, soul, and spirit, that invisible realm where we cannot see, but where you see. Spirit of the living God, help us, we pray, to hear all that would be said to us through the Word of God, your sword, O Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Our scripture reading is found in John's Gospel, John chapter 16. Just a few verses today. We're going to read from verse 12 to verse 15. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 16, reading from verse 12 to verse 15. It will be on the screen for those who will be following that way too. Let's hear the Word of God. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. This is the Word of God. (coughs) If I could have picked a Sunday on which it would have been really good to have landed on John chapter 16, verses 12 to 15, then of course this Sunday is that Sunday. I would love to say it's down to my brilliant organizational skills that I had months in advance knew that this Sunday was going to be connected with this passage. Therefore, I orchestrated and worked it that it would be that way. But those of you who know me know my administration skills are not that great. Maybe getting better a little bit, but they're still not that great. But in the providence of God, we're here in this passage this day on Pentecost Sunday when Jesus is speaking about the coming Holy Spirit. Now, He's already affirmed to the disciples in the upper room that the Spirit who would come, the Counselor who would come, the Advocate who would come is the Spirit of truth. And Jesus is going to affirm to them some more of that in the passage before us. We saw two weeks ago that he said another purpose of the Holy Spirit when he came would be to convict the world of guilt, and guilt in regard to sin, in regards to righteousness, and in regards to judgment. But Jesus is moving now from the Holy Spirit being one who would bring guilt to the world, conviction of guilt, to now bringing comfort to guide confused disciples. So he's moving from guilt to guidance. He's moving from the work of the Spirit to speak to the world, now to the work of the Spirit to speak to his disciples. But before we get to that, we notice, didn't we, in verse 12, where Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. We know as we've been going through these chapters in John that the disciples are confused, they're burdened, they're weary, they're tired, they're full of grief. And now Jesus sees them at a point where there's, if you like, almost to them, some sort of spiritual overload. They just can't get their heads around all that is being said and all that is coming at them. And Jesus recognizes that. And Jesus is saying, okay, you're not ready to take this, but you will at some point get that. But I'm not going to give that to you just in these moments. And it just lets us know that Jesus knows what we need to know when we need to know it. And sometimes even as Christians, we can get into places that feel like saturation points. It feels like we just cannot take any more in. And maybe we feel that we've kind of leveled, as it were, in some way, and we're just struggling maybe to take in some truth of God. I remember many, many years ago at Bible college where I was getting this fantastic teaching and truth, and it was coming at me from all angles, and I was loving it, but at some point it just seemed to saturate because I thought, I can't take any more in. It's too much for me to grasp and to comprehend. So I went for a walk one day, sunny day, in this lovely field. I got in the middle of the field. I sat down, I lay down, and I just fell asleep because I was exhausted. And it was an old cow that woke me up. Well, whether it was an old cow or not, I'm not totally sure, but it was licking up my sandal. And I was surrounded by a herd of cows. And I was absolutely terrified, I must admit. And I don't know if they sensed something of a relative in my old leather sandal. I hope not, but they were licking the bottom of my feet. I quickly got out of there. But the point is just simply, I was so tired. 
mentally, physically, even though it was good stuff that was making me tired and I just needed a bit of space to comprehend it. But here's an interesting thought that I wonder if you've ever thought, that there are sometimes there are certain truths we just don't get. It may be because of tiredness, it may be because of spiritual warfare, but it may just simply be that Jesus knows we're not in the place yet to receive it. He knew there was still much more that he wanted to tell his disciples, but he knew his disciples were not yet ready in the place to receive that truth. And sometimes there can be times in our lives when maybe we're trying to get our head around a certain truth and we can't just seem to get it. And it might be that we don't get it simply because Jesus is knowing you're not yet ready to receive it. But at another point, you might well be. And that's a wonderful encouragement to me. Sometimes we can get caught up in stuff that we're trying to get our heads around and it's difficult to get our heads around. And here's another thing, that sometimes what we think is the priority in terms of what we need to get, Jesus actually has other things that he wants to teach us which are a priority for him. But we see here that while, and this is, I think, fascinating, that while these apostles, these disciples in this upper room are really struggling to get their head around stuff, Jesus said, you know, there's so much more that I really want to tell you, and I really want to tell you right now, but you're not ready to take it, but you will get it at another time. And I know you're not ready, but you need to be ready to hear this. There's so much I want to tell you, you can't take, but this I am going to tell you, because this you need to hear, and this you need to take. And it's the same with us. We need to hear the truth that Jesus is going to speak to these disciples here in this upper room. And it's related to his truth. And it's about the Spirit of God who's going to come and who's going to speak to the disciples the truth of God. And we're going to see there are three things about this truth that Jesus wants them to hear today, or back then, and He wants us to hear today. He wants us to know that the truth that the Spirit of God will bring is definite truth. He wants us to know that the truth that the Spirit of God brings is sufficient truth. And He wants us to know that the truth that the Spirit of God brings will be exalting truth. So, it's definite truth, it's sufficient truth, and it's exalting truth. In terms of it being definite truth, verse 13, we read these words. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. Now, there are two ways that we want to understand definite here. And the first way is simply this. Jesus is saying that when the Spirit comes, He will speak to you that which is absolutely true, that which is clear, and that which is undeniable about who I am, about my person, and about my work. The Spirit of God is going to come, and He's going to make it so clear to you. And He's going to make it clear to you because what He brings for you to hear and to understand is in complete harmony within the Holy Godhead. The truth that he brings is not something he's going to make up by himself. It's something that he's going to bring that is in agreement with what the Father believes and what the Father knows and shows and what I believe and what I show. And that is in relation to my person, who I am, the essence of who I am, that I am God among you and I've come from God the Father. I am God the Son and God the Holy Spirit will bring the same truth to you. He would go on to say in verse 15, these words. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So, the Holy Spirit is coming to bring the essential truth of who Jesus is as light and truth. Isn't that why in John 1, 9, it tells us that, that He was in full nature God, and that He came the one who would be the true light that brings light to the world. In that little phrase, true light, we get both He's true, He's absolute, and He's the light. He's the way that we need. And the Spirit of God is bringing that truth and light about Jesus Christ. Why? Because in Psalm 43, we're also reminded when the psalmist prays, he says, O God, send forth your truth and your light, 
that they will guide me. The realm where God exists is a realm of truth and a realm of life. The Son has been sent the full expression of that truth and life of God. The Son has come full of truth and light, and the Son says that now that I've ascended to the Father, I'm going to send to you truth and light in the Spirit who will confirm to you the truth and light of the reality of who I am and what I have done. It's definite. It's clear. It's undeniable. It's absolute. That's one way to understand definite. But there's another way to understand definite. Now, I did put it on the Bible reading on the screen, but in your NIV, if you're reading an NIV, or if you're reading a King James Version, you might not just have seen it. The eagle-eyed among you might have seen it on the screen, because I put it in the text on the screen. But in the NIV, I'll read it to you. It says this, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. There's a slight problem with the text here. It should read this, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. Definite article. And what that is referring to is that Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is going to come, and He's going to teach you all that you need to be taught that will be collated in a specific body of material that will become the essential truth that will need to be taught about me, not only to you, but it will be used by you, through you, the apostles, who the Spirit of God will use, and the associates of the apostles, and Paul, who is deemed to be an apostle, as those instruments God would use to bring together that body of material that would be collated together to be called the New Testament so that the Spirit of God would be orchestrating and working that this truth and light of Jesus is confined and contained within a book that we call the Bible, so that that truth will not change, so that that truth will go to every tongue and every tribe and every nation throughout every generation, so that it will not be people determining themselves, oh, well, I think the Spirit said this, and I think the Spirit said that. No, we have the truth here. And Jesus is saying specifically to the apostles, this is going to be a work of my Spirit to you and through you so that we might have collated together all that needs to be collated about me in this book. It's definite. We have all that we need to know about Jesus and His work, which is why we move on to truth that is sufficient. Verse 14 He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Now, he's making it known to the disciples in the upper room. He will make it known through the disciples to associates of the apostles and to the apostle Paul. And we have many denominations today, you know, which have their leaders called apostles, but they're not apostles in the biblical sense. They're not apostles in the true sense of those who were actively present through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who'd experienced the life of Jesus, who were there following the death of Jesus, the the resurrection of Jesus, and the ascension of Jesus. You go, well, Paul wasn't there. Yes, but Paul encountered the living Christ on the road to Damascus. That's why he was able to be referred to as an apostle. But we're seeing here that we have together then in the Scriptures all that is necessary all that is sufficient for us to know salvation and sanctification in Jesus Christ contained within the Scriptures. We don't get all there is to know about Jesus Christ. We don't get all there is to know about the future. That little phrase where we read, He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you, Don Carson says this. The preposition from shows that the revelation the Spirit provides is not the entire sum of truth surrounding Christ. Finite minds could not comprehend it, even if it were given. So, think of, a, think of a billionaire, and a billionaire gives to charity, and he gives 20 million pounds. We go, wow, that's a, that's a lot of money to be given to charity, but he's given from all that he has at his disposal. He's not given all of it, but he's given from it. 
And Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit will come and he will take from what is mine and he will make it known to you. But he can't make it all known to you because you couldn't comprehend it. You couldn't fathom it. You're finite. In my divine being, I'm infinite. You can't comprehend the infinite. But he will let you know what you need to know that is sufficient for life and for godliness. He will let you know what you need to know that is sufficient for you to be a follower of me in time. He will let you know what you need to know about the end times. Not all the minutiae, not every single detail, not all of it, but enough that you need to know. Didn't John himself even write at the end of John's gospel regarding the earthly works of Jesus, that if, if we tried to account for even all the earthly works of Jesus, he said there wouldn't be enough books or there wouldn't be enough libraries in the whole world to contain all the books that could be said about Jesus. And he's only speaking about the earthly works of Jesus. He wasn't speaking about how he sustains all things by his powerful word, the billions of stars and the billions of galaxies and every single breath that you breathe and every single cell in your body. He's not going into how all that works. He's not going into all the minutia and the detail of exactly what will happen in the end times. But he's reminding us there will be an end time. He's reminding us the Lord Jesus will return again. He reminds us there will be a judgment. There will be a separation of those who know God from those who don't know God. He's reminding us of what we need to know to live in this time for this time, and that will take us to all time through faith in Jesus Christ regarding the person and work of who he is. It is sufficient. We don't need others to come along and say, well, you know, and listen, don't hear me say God can't give someone a vision. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying God cannot do stuff that is beyond the norm. I believe God can do miracles. Of course I do. I'm not saying he doesn't, and I'm not saying he can't. But what I am saying is this, is that this is sufficient, because it's through the written word that we come to know the living word. It's the way that God has ordained it to be, that those apostles, those associates of the apostles, the apostle Paul, who wrote pretty much most of what is in the New Testament, would be those who would be moved by the Spirit to scribe what is written, so that through that is written, we know the one who is living and forevermore and ever will be, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have all that we need within the word to know him. So here's the question. If you want to grow to the Word, you must go. Are you growing in Jesus by going to the Word? Or are you one who's saying, oh, Lord, give me an experience of your Spirit. Let your Spirit move in me to help me understand you, to help me to see you, and this book just sits there. Oh, Lord, I pray that you will just anoint me from on high. Let me be a faithful witness to you, Jesus. Let me do what you want me to do. But the Word just sits on your shelf. Or do you take it to your capacity, to your ability, not someone else's, but to yours? That'll be different from someone else's. But you go to the Word and you delve into the Word. I'm in Leviticus at the moment. Now, Leviticus is one of those books where you might go, oh, I'm absolutely loving Leviticus. I'm just really enjoying Leviticus at the moment, and it's getting my head going in all kinds of different directions, because a lot of people critique the Bible, and one of the big arguments is the things that they use is Leviticus and the Levitical laws, but I'm really enjoying Leviticus at the minute. And I'm thinking, well, if they said that, here's how I would, from Leviticus, answer that. And I'm just really enjoying Leviticus. Not a book I thought I would ever really enjoy, but I am. And I want to delve deeper into it. And I want to get a bit deeper into Leviticus. Whether I ever preach a series on Leviticus, I don't know. We will see. But go to God's Word. Get into the Word and let the Word get into you because the Spirit of God takes the Word of God to transform your life. And we're going to see that just now. The truth that the Spirit of God comes to bring, it is truth that is definite. You can count on it. It is real. It is clear about the person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ. It is sufficient truth. 
It is sufficient for you to live the life that God wants you to live. You have all that you need to know about Jesus in this life contained within the Bible. So if you want to know Jesus, go to the Bible. Now, not just for information, but for inspiration. Read the Word of God. Let the Word of God read you and show you Jesus. Because this is ultimately what Jesus said, the purpose of the Spirit's coming to bring this truth. Verse 15, all that belongs to me, oh, sorry, verse 14, he will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Now, it's important that we get this here, that Jesus is saying the Spirit of God is going to bring glory to me. What does that mean, bring glory? Well, what does the word glory primarily mean in the New Testament understanding? Well, it means to see, to feel the weightiness of something, the importance of something, the significance of something. John 1, we have seen His glory. We have felt the weight of who He is. We have seen the importance and the significance of who this Jesus is that walked among us. The Word became flesh. He came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen His glory. We have felt the weight of Him, if you like, upon our lives. And Jesus says that the Spirit of God comes that you might know the significance of who I am, that you might understand the importance of who I am, that you might feel the weight of who I am in your life. Do you? Do I feel the weightiness the significance, the importance of Jesus Christ upon our life? Or do we get through most of our days pretty much without knowing anything of the weightiness of that, the significance of that, or the importance of that? And Jesus just becomes this little tag-on, this little add-on. When we need Him, yes, oh, He's important then, He's significant then, but He's significant at all times and should be for us. Well, how practically might this impact your life? You see, it's not just for information that the Spirit reminds you of the importance of Jesus. It's for transformation, that we might be transformed and changed from one degree of glory to another. Well, how might that work practically in your life? Well, let's say in your workplace, you're struggling because you're concerned about what people might think about you, Let's say at night time you're not sleeping too well because someone has said something about you or to you that has rattled your cage. Let's say you're out with a certain group of friends or company, but you can't really enjoy it because you're worrying too much about, are they going to think I'm funny enough? Are they going to think I'm smart enough? Are they going to think this? Are they going to think that? And you rob yourself of so much life because you spend so much time worrying about what people think. In other words, you give people glory. You give them a weightiness. You give them a significance. You give them an importance over your life that is not meant to be over your life. There's only one who's supposed to have that weightiness and significance and importance upon your life, and that's Jesus. How many of us at times don't sleep too well at night because we're worrying about the opinions of others? When if we're worshiping Jesus for the opinion of Him, now therefore no condemnation to you who are in Christ. If God is for you, who can be against you? Cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. If we allow the glory of Jesus to impact our minds and our hearts, it will bring transformation. It will bring inspiration. And you will not be worrying so much about the opinions of others. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. We need to hear what people say, especially if we're being, you know, not really the Christians we should be. It's good to be reminded of what we should be. 
but we don't let it weigh us down to the point of crippling us and paralyzing us and stopping us sleeping in blessed peace and knowing the enjoyment of company of others that we want to be with. And even when it comes to a place where someone might say, you're just an old stupid so-and-so, we go, hey, that's okay. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, yes, but he is strong. And this Jesus loves me. This Jesus died for me. This Jesus rose for me. This Jesus ascended for me. This Jesus will one day come again for me. His opinion. I want to stand before him one day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You will have no rule or authority over me, not in this life or the next. Only he does. And if we really get this, really get this, do you know what you will be? Free. Because the truth will set you free. Free to not be enslaved to the opinions of others when you know that Jesus is your truth. He's the definite truth. He's the sufficient truth. And he is the one we're called to exalt. And could I say today as well that if any here are saying, well, you know, the Bible's okay, but can't really accept all that's there about, you know, what it says about God and Jesus, and could I caution you? because Jesus is saying, who's the one that brought the Bible? Spirit of God. Where did the Spirit of God come from? It came from the realm where God himself dwells, where Jesus ascended to, to send the Spirit from that realm so that the Bible might come together so that we might see the person and work of Jesus. I'm not saying we'll understand everything in it, but we'll understand what we need to understand the truth of who Jesus is, why he came, what he did, and what that can mean for your life to change and transform you. Christian, you're free in Jesus. You don't need to be ensnared by the opinions of others. And if you're not yet a Christian, come to Jesus. Come to the truth of who he is. Don't be depending on your own opinion don't be depending on your own salvation, but let Jesus Christ be your one, only true salvation. Let's pray. Maybe just take a moment, folks. Ask a couple of questions. Am I seeing the glory of Jesus? Is my life reflecting the glory of Jesus? Is he my all in all? Do I believe all that the Word of God says about him in an age which is telling me it's ancient tales that have no present relevance? Or are you standing firm in the Word of God that points you to the living Word, Jesus Christ? Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for the living Word who walked in this scene of time, who taught a bunch, a motley crew, but who transformed their lives with his glory, the weight of who he is, and the wonder and significance of his coming, his death, his resurrection, ascension, and promise of coming again, but who until that time has sent his Holy Spirit to enable them and equip them to scribe what we can hold in our hands, what we can see on our tablets, what we can read on a daily basis. O oh Lord, we pray we would see your truth the truth of who Jesus is and what he did so that that truth would set us free. Hear us, we pray.
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing when we walk with the Lord. the grace together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.